Hello and welcome to the next session of our virtual summit. Uh, this session we're going to talk about DevOps patterns and anti-patterns for continuous software updates. Before we start talking about updates themselves, let's ask ourselves why we need updates at all. It sounds like a kind of a strange question, uh, but think about it for a second. There are software that doesn't require updates at all. So for example, ABC is a common line calculator uh, and it wasn't updated for 20 years, which kind of makes sense. Uh, the basic rules of math didn't change. The uh, how shell operate didn't change. I have a question why it was updated so frequently prior to 2000, but uh, other than that, no, there is no reason for update. But obviously most of the software doesn't work like that. For most of the software, we actually have pretty frequent updates for a couple of reasons. The first is obviously the users require features and they require those features as frequently as possible. This is kind of a, a market pressure that we want those shiny things and we want them as soon as possible. And one of the examples, think about how your thinking changed when it comes to uh, mobile phones. Um, if you are old enough to remember how the mobile phones were uh, worked in, in, in the 90s, uh, you had uh, probably your Nokia phone that had or didn't have the snake game. And if you were unlucky to have one without and you wanted the snake game, the only thing that you could possibly do is go to a store and buy a new one. There was this thing called a data cable, if you remember, you had to buy to go to the store and buy it. And then what you could do with it? Well, you could back up your contacts when you buy a new phone to get a snake game. Obviously everything changed with, um, with the iPhone 2007 and um, anywhere by the two, uh, 2010, uh, you expected to have your um, applications that you uploaded to your phone and then you were updating them whenever you liked. But today it's even more than that. They are auto updated and you get your shiny new features every day without doing anything. So this is kind of expected now and we expect new updates, we expect new software, we expect new versions every, every time. Another reason is security. Uh, you can uh, think about uh, security vulnerabilities um, as dangerous as the new oil spills. Uh, everybody talk about them, everybody are concerned about them. The big uh, security uh, data breaches are making the front, uh, the front pages and uh, those are the big news. And fighting those is an interesting process as well. Uh, if you ever... Um, I took um, driving lessons and uh, for, for your driving license, you remember um, this formula of a stopping distance. When stopping distance is built from two different uh, mechanics, the thinking distance and the braking distance, they work completely differently. So thinking distance is um, the light of the obstacle is hitting your retina and then your brain got activated and you figure out that you need to brake and you send um, electro signals to your leg that pushes on the brakes. And then the braking distance come into play, and that's a completely different mechanism. It's um, physics, uh, the pressure that you apply on the pedal, the transfer, the, the pressure that the um, braking pads apply on the, um, on the wheels, and uh, it's chemistry, the compounds of the braking pads, and uh, how good the road pavement is, completely different uh, story. But in the end of the day, the combination of those two completely different uh, um, different mechanics actually contribute to what is called the stopping distance. And um, when you battle those, uh, your battle is on two fronts. So you, on the braking distance, you come with better compounds for the, um, for the braking pads, you come with better, um, better tires and better roads. And when it comes to thinking distance, you probably just replace humans, slow humans with faster machines. And this is all the emergency braking and autopilot and assistant course controls and all that. Uh, when it comes to security vulnerabilities, it's pretty much the same. You have three different, um, three completely different parts that all uh, combine together into this time to mitigate um, a security problem. Uh, identification that you actually have, was, uh, have been breached, the, the fix, which in most of the time will be updating the dependency, either it's your programmatic dependency, like you know the dependency that you use in code, or your 
system dependency, for example, the operating system that you use. Um, and then in the end of the day, um, the faster you deploy, the better, um, the better you are, of course. And here are a couple of examples just for you to understand what I'm talking about. So this is uh, three years ago, uh, the UK hospital meltdown because um, of the vulnerable uh, operating system, right? So there was a ransomware on Peta, whatever it's called. And um, obviously the hospitals realized that they cannot do surgeries because their computers are locked and all their data is encrypted. But the problem was because they used Windows XP, which wasn't supported a very long time ago, even back in 2017, they didn't update it and this is why they were vulnerable. So open operating system upgrade was the fix. It took them years to actually upgrade their operating system and this is why they suffered. Um, another example is the Equifax mega hack. Uh, again, uh, two and a half years ago, you all remember that uh, the problem there was uh, again a dependency, um, namely Struts, the um, Java framework that wasn't updated and it took them two months to even identify they had a problem and then two months to uh, actually roll out an upgrade of their Struts um, dependency. Uh, obviously, I cannot argue that um, the damage would be any less if the uh, deployment were faster, but um, I think we can uh, kind of speculate it probably would. And uh, if you say to, myself, to yourself, well, I don't do that, I know how to update my dependencies and I don't use an operating system which is out of service for many years, I have um, bad news for you. Um, so you all know how 2020 started and it was, it's not a spectacular start, but if you remember 2019 started um, in some worrying news as well. And that was uh, the Spectre and Meltdown attacks. Um, the meltdown was in the news a lot because by um, just a couple of lines of JavaScript code, you were able to steal a password from a protected or not so protected uh, memory area. But um, actually, a Spectre is not less frightening. I think it's even more because Spectre is impossible to defeat. Spectre is a speculative uh, attack that um, by looking at the code of other people, the attacker can speculate how code of particular application will behave and how the CPU um, will uh, behave and will uh, speculatively optimize the memory and then make assumptions on a, which part of memory a, should they look uh, for a, in order to find data that should be again protected. Um, so the problem is that the better code you write uh, by using best practices and design patterns, the more vulnerable you are. And uh, do we have a solution for that? Should we just write a horrible code so it won't be predictable and people cannot guess how our, our code looks like? Um, probably not. So there is no really good solution for that except of being vigilant and being ready to identify the problem as soon as possible, um, fix the problem or the dependencies as soon as possible, and then deploy and uh, update our software as soon as possible. So this is all very gloom, but the good news are that it's not that bad. Uh, we can look at the paramount of research in DevOps, the State of DevOps Report uh, 2019, and we can see that um, after surveying uh, more than 30,000 uh, different organizations, uh, we can see that 20% of the industry, 20% of the organizations surveyed are actually elite performance, uh, every fifth organization. And what does elite performance mean? Um, it means that uh, you can see that the um, elite organizations deploy on demand multiple deployments per day. And that means obviously that if they have a new feature, they can roll it out immediately and let uh, the, um, the users benefit from it. Uh, and if they have a security breach, they can um, uh, deploy the fix immediately, update all their software and uh, get protected. And the reason why 20% uh, of the industry does that, because those are by no means a new, um, a new ideas. Um, you can think back to 1998, 22 years ago, how extreme programming advocated for short, or short feedback. And then 2000 Scrum, 20 years ago, reducing cycle time to an absolute minimum. And then Toyota production system advocates deciding as less as possible, deliver as, as fast as possible, which means shorter cycle. And Kanban um, advocates for incremental change, which basically means shorter uh, cycle as well. So those are new, those are by no means not new um, ideas. Uh, and we see that a big part of the industry already implements a 20%. And you might ask, but why only 20%? 
Um, my name is Baruch Sadogurski. I'm a chief sticker officer, but also a head of developer advocacy at JFrog. Um, the most important part of this slide is my Twitter handle. You should follow me in order for us to get in touch. Probably that will be the easiest way for me to answer your questions, since all this stuff is now virtual. Anyway, AJ Baruch at your service. Um, another kind of disclaimer. Um, this is an amazing a chart from Andrew Aaron Meyer's Culture Map book. If you you if you work with uh, multiple cultures, as you probably are, uh, make sure uh, reading this book. Now the quarantine is a, a good opportunity for us to uh, get some reading and culture map. It's definitely a, um, one of the most recommended things to do uh, while you are on lockdown. Um, what you see in this diagram is that most emotionally expensive and confrontational people are from Israel and Russia. And I happen to be from both. Um, that means that I might say something um, offensive during this uh, presentation and for uh, apologies in advance if I don't manage to offend you in, in any way. Um, anyway, with this disclaimer aside, the most important slide of today's talk is obviously um, jeffrey.com uh, um, slash show notes. You can go there and you'll find a special page dedicated to the virtual summit in which you'll find those slides already uploaded. Um, the recording that you are watching now is there as well. Uh, all the links to everything that I mentioned, including culture map and the uh, uh, state of DevOps report, but also all the rest, um, a place for uh, commenting, for, rent, uh, for ratings, uh, and also a small raffle to thank you for, uh, for being here. So with that, let's go back to our topic and let's see an example what happens when someone wants to update faster. And the example that I want to give is um, Java. Um, more than uh, almost, yeah, almost two and a half years ago, um, Mark Reynolds, who is the platform architect for Java, uh, declared that Java is moving uh, forward faster. And that means that um, they will switch um, from a um, random uh, release cadence that was uh, declared to be year and a half or maybe two years, but in fact was everything between three and eight years to a very strict release cadence of six months um, each time. Um, every new version will be released um, every six months, no matter what. And this, as I mentioned, happened um, um, almost two and a half years ago. So since then, um, a lot of a lot of Java versions were released. That was when the Java 8 was the um, the latest version. Since then, we had Java 9, Java 10, Java 11, Java 12, Java 13, and just released Java 14. So we had six different releases since then. And let's see how those releases are uh, being adopted by the uh, by the market. What you see here, the state of Java trends and data from one of the world's most popular programming languages, a blog post by uh, Ben Evans um, about the metrics that they collect in New Relic uh, from live systems, from millions of JVMs that run all across the world in any different organizations and industries and what's not. So that's a pretty reliable data on where the world stands now in terms of adoption of different Java versions. And what you see here is something extraordinary. 85%, almost 85% are still using Java, uh, Java 8. After um, almost two and a half years, after six different versions of Java, the world is still stuck on Java 8. And you're surprised, you should be, because we just spoke about it, how important the software updates are, how important it is to um, release the software faster in order for customers to adapt the software faster. But what you see is that the customers are not adapting the software. The question is why? To answer this question, I think we need to understand how do people update their software. And you can think about it as a flow diagram or decision diagram. So the update is available and then we need to decide if we want it or not. If there is nothing interesting there like Java 9, for example, then we just know. We, we won't update. There is nothing there that we care about. If there is some interesting stuff in it, then you need to answer the question, if, are there high risks? Sometimes there are no high risks, and then you just update. And here, I can give you an example. I don't know. Your um, 
favorite streaming platform. Uh, they release an update for your phone or something, and you just update because there are probably new features like skipping the boring parts, and, and there's almost no high risk because if they screw something up, you can always switch to your second favorite streaming provider and it will be just fine. Um, it's actually quite hard now to find, um, so, so yeah, so everything which is not, which is not high risk. Um, if there is high risk, the next question will be, do you trust the update? And, and here it's quite hard to find an example now of vendor that we can blindly or almost blindly trust. It used to be Apple. Um, if you have your Mac for, I would say, like more than four years, you might remember the time when you blindly updated the Mac OS when notification came, because why not? Um, recently, it's not so much. And um, I bet the majority of you didn't even still update to the latest uh, Mac OS, although it has been like for half a year that it's already out by now, but still you're hesitant because it's pretty critical update. It's your working machine um, and you don't trust the update anymore. And the question is, so if you trust, there is no issue, but if you don't trust, the question is why? What happened uh, that you used to trust your software updates and now you don't trust them anymore? Um, there are two um, possible alternatives. The first is people forgot how to do QA, uh, which sounds a little bit um, unlikely that people suddenly forgot how to do QA. So there have to be another explanation. And I think there is. Um, as uh, JFrog, we deal with binaries. So we look at everything through our binary glasses. And um, even the complexity can be measured um, as a number of artifacts as a symptom for this complexity. So you remember, uh, it's all started with Agile 20 years ago. We have continuous integration. Things got complicated. We need to, we build much more uh, artifacts that we need to jungle and uh, juggle and make, make sense of. Uh, each one of them is a possible candidate for release by the continuous uh, delivery methodology. So that brings even more complexity. Infrastructure as code now our uh, hardware is, is is software as well so this makes things more complicated uh, microservices obviously we have a lot of moving parts and things got much more complicated with microservices docker every line and docker file generates more and more artifacts that we need to uh, measure and then obviously serverless so let's pack every 10 lines of javascript as their own artifact and run it on serverless platforms and obviously IoT when you run Kubernetes and your light bulbs and the complexity is mind blowing. But even more than the complexity of your architecture and your code is uh, the sheer amount of data. And this is a survey done by uh, uh, a Seagate, they sell hard drives, so they might be a little bit biased, but uh, even if you, uh, you are skeptical, you can understand that the amount of data is extraordinary. Mm, for your reference, zettabytes, and this is what comes after exabytes. Um, today we think about big data in petabytes. Well, exabytes is the next thing. It's like really, really, really big data. And zettabytes, it's even more. So this is like really a lot of data. and. Uh, you can um, you can uh, think about this um, sheer explosion of data as one of the symptoms why, for example, the staging server is is dead. The same in staging server, the idea of staging environment is to replicate the production environment as close as possible. Uh, when you think about uh, this amount of data, you realize that replicating staging server with this amount of data is literally impossible, and if possible, definitely not worth it from a, from economic perspective. It's just, it's just way too expensive to recreate. And then people start um, testing in production and then all kinds of things um, can happen uh, in, in, in the result of that, uh, but definitely not more trust in, the, in your updates. So when we go back to uh, this diagram and we assume that um, we cannot trust uh, the, 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 our, uh, uh, our updates because probably they, uh, there is a high chance that they won't work as expected. The next question will be, um, can we verify the update? And can we verify the update? Actually, is it worth for us to verify the update? And the answer to that is 
a lot of times no. Um, for Java, it's released every six months. Um, it takes uh, seven months for us to uh, do acceptance tests. Obviously, there is no reason for us to do it for each and every update. Instead, we will wait a couple of updates. We will wait until there will be enough food on the table, and only that we will only then we will do this consuming uh, time consuming verification or acceptance tests um, in order to uh, get our updates working. So a lot of food on the table is required in order for us to be motivated enough to do those acceptance tests. And it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between the features that we really want and the acceptance test costs. And the problem with that is that it generates incentive, which is the opposite than the one that we started with. We started by saying releasing frequently is, um, is a good thing, but now we have to struggle to provide more and more features in every update to um, kind of motivate uh, users to get our software. So instead of releasing fast uh, multiple times a day, instead we start um, grouping the, the updates so they have more interesting features for our uh, customers to take. And this is the opposite of what we actually want. So how do we break this trade-off? Can we um, somehow cheat it? Well, we can to an extent. And this is what those 20% of the industry do. So update is available. Do we want it? Yes, but also no one asked you. Auto update is on. We're just going to get this update no matter what. And then we will just have it. And it works for uh, obviously no, no, no low risk software like your browser. Chances are you have no idea which version of a browser are you using because the opt update is on. You will get new versions. You will get new features as frequently as your the browser provider decides they want to give you those features. And worst case scenario, if it doesn't work, you will switch to alternative browser. You probably have like two or three installed anyway, and it will be just fine for a day until they fix it. Um, every software uh, in your browser, every, every website, every, every web service, you actually have no control on uh, whether you want the update or not. It will just appear one day, and the only thing you can do is rant about the new U, U, uh, UX or UI, um, but that, that's all, no one asks you. Um, it also goes into most of the apps in your, in your smartphone. Um, most, most of the modern operating systems for mobile are set to be auto-update for all the apps, so the apps will be automatically updated and you'll probably don't know that their version or if they got updated or not. It's not very true for your smartphone operating system because this is where this cheat breaks because we go into the territory of the higher risk applications. So here you have it. Um, we know how to auto update and we know how to do um, those frequent updates, but we hesitate to do it for critical applications because we cannot manage to build this trust in order to do that. So let's talk about what can possibly go wrong, why we don't have this trust, and how can we make it better. So let's start our dive into uh, patterns and unten patterns with a personal story. Um, three years ago, I bought a great um, Wi-Fi router that was called OnHub back then. Now it's called uh, Google Wi-Fi. One of the promises was a self-improving system. Self-improving system means auto updates over the air. Great, I loved the idea by then. Um, and it actually been a, a great experience. Um, the best Wi-Fi router I ever bought and then actually extended to Wi-Fi mesh, great stuff. Um, saying that, um, an incident happened um, a couple of years ago. Um, I was on a business trip um, somewhere out of the country. I think it was exactly three years ago. Um, and um, I got a call from my wife and she goes like, Baruch, the kids are sitting in the dark. And I'm like, what happened? Why they are sitting in the dark? Is this like a power outage? And she's like, no, the Wi-Fi is down. Uh, the internet is down. And they shout, Alexa, turn on the lights. Alexa, turn on the lights. And nothing happens. Um, so yeah, that day they learned there are physical switches on the wall, uh, but we also started to investigate what's wrong with our internet. And I called our provider, everything was fine. And then I got this email that says, well, uh, sincerest apologies for any issues. Uh, we sent an update to your, um, uh, to your Wi-Fi and on-hub devices, and they were reset to their factory settings. 
and now they are disconnected from the internet so we cannot send them an update that will fix them and you are kindly requested to go ahead and reconfigure them manually uh, one of the caveats is to get an email you actually have to have an internet uh, hopefully thankfully i was on on, on, a, a, on a hotel wi-fi or a conference wi-fi so i got this email and then we were able to uh, reconfigure the uh, the, uh, the Wi-Fi modem and get it get it back on track. Uh, but I think that there are a couple of interesting um, interesting um, takeaways to learn from that. So first of all, a local local rollback um, updates went catastrophically wrong, and the over day patch cannot reach the device. That's exactly what happened. It was a reset to uh, factory settings, and now you cannot send. Um, uh, an update that will fix it because it's disconnected from the internet. Mm, obviously, with a Wi-Fi router, it's not that critical because there are people around that can fix the problem for it. But think about, for example, um, a solar array in the Sahara Desert when you have to fly over there on helicopters for three hours and then ride camels to get to it for another three days. Um, obviously, that's a lot of production loss, um, and uh, obviously there has to be a better way and the better way is, is local rollback you can um, save a previous version save it on the device and then roll back in case of problem occur obviously you need to watch it you need observability we're going to get to it but in the end of the day local local um, rollback fills the problem the thing is we been living with a local local rollback for um, for decades now think about any windows i think since windows 95 or 98 for sure that when you plug the new monitor or a new video card and change the resolution it was showing you that your desktop has reconfigured do you want to keep those settings and then you had a countdown that were revert a local rollback automatically if you didn't acknowledge because you were the monitor and you should and if the resolution was fine you should have canceled the um, automatic revert otherwise it would revert automatically something like that implemented in the Wi-Fi modem for example if it doesn't come back online in uh, 30 seconds then revert to a previous version um, of the um, uh, of the modem would actually solve the problem that I had so um, this is an example of um, IoT nature, right? A wireless router and this stuff. Um, and and uh, maybe you, could, you think why, uh, why am I speaking about that? But the things in the IoT stands for, uh, for everything, any device um, over any network uh, for, for anyone. And uh, actually the, 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 the things that we can learn from IoT are completely um, adaptable for non-IoT life as well. But I love the IoT examples because they're really, really real world. And another real world example is self-updating cars. Um, let's talk about that for, for a minute. So uh, Jaguar I-PACE um, released only uh, last year and um, the, half a year after it was released, half a year ago, um, they had to issue um, a software update to fix a bug in their brakes. Um, well, that makes sense. Everything runs on software, including the brakes and the cars. But the problem is Jaguar didn't have uh, over their updates. Um, and, and then what they had to do is actually uh, place a physical recall to get the cars in service to update the software, which is, which is weird because uh, physical recalls are, are extremely costly and also you cannot force an upgrade. Um, you can send emails to people that will get to spam. You can send physical letters to people that they might or might not read. You can, what, what else you can do? Write it on a, on a red paper, like print it on a red paper. That's the most intimidating you can do, but you cannot really force them. Uh, the solution for that is obviously over the air software updates that makes it uh, very, very fast updates. And also you can push the update for critical bugs like bugs in, the, in, in breaking um, over there without asking actually anything, anyone. And um, obviously there are companies that do over their updates, um, but the pre preferred way is continuous over their updates. They are like normal over their updates, but better. And let's talk about another car that is completely driven by software, and that's Tesla. And although the car is amazing because it is a computer on wheels, not a car with a computer in it, it's all driven by software, which changes how we even think about vehicles. Uh, one of the most annoying things in Tesla is what is called the phantom braking. 
So quantum braking is a, is a thing. It's like, think about it, you drive on autopilot, and there is a bright day, no obstacles, no overpasses, no clouds, nothing, and then car slams on the brakes. Um, very annoying. Uh, the most annoying thing is if you are with your family, they will never believe that the car did that. They will blame it on you, and you, you don't know what to say because it wasn't you. So anyway, super annoying. Um, there was a rumor on one of the versions that uh, the quantum braking is fixed. Uh, and um, people are waiting for this update and they're waiting and the after that will come and they wait because there is a real issue. And in the end of the day, the update arrived and it turns out that we waited for this update because chess. Um, this update has chess, uh, media volume improvements, and also minor improvements and bug fixes, which is this fix for, uh, for phantom breaking. And you're like, why wasn't it released sooner? Um, because we're waiting for chess? Who needs chess? But also, there are people who love chess, and they, because they're smart and love chess, they all don't use autopilot. So for them, if uh, the team worked on autopilot, instead of releasing the chess faster, that was um, also not optimal. Because the problem with bulky updates is that important features wait for not important features, no matter how do you define the importance. And importance is different for different people. So for those who use the autopilot, obviously the phantom breaking fix is more important than chess. And for people who don't use autopilot but love chess, chess is more important than the autopilot fix. And there is no way to fix it instead of just stop waiting one features to another features, regardless of what you think important or not. So you implement continuous updates and you release the second the feature is out there, being it fixed for phantom breaking or chess, just push it and people will be more happy. And of course, you will be able to sell the problems faster and ship the features faster, which is, um, which is great. Um, just um, think how many of you are in the IoT business, uh, updating cars, automotive, mobile, probably not many. And the question is, why do I even bother uh, bothering you with all those topics of IoT and automotive? And the answer is, um, if you think that your problems as backend developers or server-side developers are hard, well, they are not. Because uh, for IoT, for example, the availability of target is not guaranteed. Um, the, the devices might be offline for undefined period of time, go ahead updating those. And the state of target is not guaranteed. We actually have no idea what's going on, on uh, in those computers and what the state they're on. And the version of target is not guaranteed. Maybe they skipped on um, five different updates and now we need to know how to update from the version which is five versions old. Um, and the access to the target is not guaranteed. Maybe the target is not available and it's, not, it's very hardly available physically, as an example, with the solar lens. So our life as a server-side um, developers that produce services updates is much easier, but even with all that, we actually manage to uh, fail spectacularly. And I think the most spectacular example of failures of uh, software updates is the Knife Capital story. Uh, it's a little bit old, but it's classic, so uh, here it goes. Um, in 2012, uh, Knight Capital um, exec uh, executing tra uh, trades uh, on a stock exchange, a huge one, fourth in size back then in Wall Street, um, loses a $440 million and gets out of business. Um, what happened? Um, they came up with a new system that reused some old APIs. Uh, they had to update um, eight servers, but forgot to update one of them. And then new uh, clients send requests to the machine containing old code, a part of the new customers, of the new clients. And then um, obviously the reaction was, well, let's roll back, undeploy all the working code. And then all the traffic went to uh, the um, uh, non-updated server. And um, no monitoring, no alerting, no debugging, 40 minutes of uh, live debugging on the live systems cost them $440 million, took them out of business. Um, spectacular. Uh, there are a lot to learn from Knight Capital. Uh, first of all, automated deployment. Uh, people are not very good in repetitive tasks. They shouldn't be trusted with software updates. Uh, once we automate everything, the problem of, oops, we forgot to update one server, cannot happen anymore. Um, 
Uh, they didn't update for a very long time. So for the majority of them, that was the first software update in Night Capital in their career. Um, obviously generates a lot of anxiety and stress and unknowns and leads to errors. Um, once we start updating frequently, uh, the skill and habit is developed. It's not a stressful event anymore. And obviously we know how to do it. We have the experience. So practice makes perfect. Continuous updates, um, promote practice of, um, of software updates. State awareness, if you pick um, on reusing old APIs and old state, you need to be aware what's going on, what's happening and what doesn't happen. And um, you actually need to be able to revert the state and know what happens when you revert, revert as well. So a lot to learn from uh, Knight Capital. Uh, another very um, interesting example is the um, Cloudflare um, downtime um, half a year ago, more or less. Uh, this is interesting because Cloudflare is a modern DevOps oriented and generally respectful for their practice company. Uh, but again, something something strange happened in Cloud, Cloudflare half a year ago. So what they do is they produce, they provide provision new rules um, and deploy new rules frequently to battle the attacks. And the uh, deployment of the single misconfigured rule actually triggered the entire, um, the entire catastrophe. And by the way, while we are on it, um, this, the Cloudflare incident actually proven to me that if the um, humanity is going to die anytime soon, it won't be because of the coronavirus, it won't be uh, because of the global warming or because of the meteorite striking the earth. Um, it will be because of a misconfigured regular expression as it happened in a Cloudflare. So the problem was that a misconfigured regular expression spiked uh, the CPU to 100% on one machine, and then it obviously spread as uh, the um, failover uh, kicked in. And um, next thing you know, affected region Earth, um, and this is quote from Cloudflare status page. Uh, so yeah, this is how CPU will end, um, uh, regex will end uh, uh, this civilization. But until it happened, let's talk about what we can do better. And obviously, um, Releasing a bug affects all the users, uh, releasing it to production, and we can help with that by releasing to a small number of users first, effectively reducing the blast radius, and then observe and see what happens. If a problem occurs, you can stop the release, revert, and update the affected users, and uh, there are two ways of approaching it. You can select, you can volunteer the users that will be uh, happy to be your beta testers and get the software faster because they want frequent updates and they trust your software and uh, you can use them for your progressive delivery. Um, the, the interesting part about progressive delivery that um, if you remember the local rollbacks, I gave you the example how it was with us for, uh, for decades, um, progressive delivery is something that we all learn uh, where we are like an eight and our parents teach us how to do laundry because on every bleacher or laundry treatment, you can see um, this warning, always spot test on a hidden surface first um, and observe. And if it doesn't go, don't continue with that. That's progressive delivery. Most of the garments that we buy come with a small cloth, which is dedicated beta tester for your progressive delivery rollout. This piece of cloth is uh, is, exist for you to test your new version of color or bleach to be tested uh, on. So that's, that's again, something that we know in the real world really well, but somehow hesitated to implement in our software updates, which is a shame. Obviously, progressive delivery should come with observability. Some problems are hard to trace, relying on user feedback only. When people are complaining on Twitter, this is not a very productive way to get feedback. Instead, uh, tracing, monitoring, and logging, and then automatic means to store the, stop the progressive delivery and roll back whatever is possible, which obviously brings us to rollbacks. Uh, fix might take time and the user suffers in the meanwhile. Instead, you implement the rollback, the ability to deploy a previous version without delay, and you tie this rollback into your observability that will make sure that in case that the, your progressive delivery goes bad, your rollback is kicked in automatically. Sometimes rollbacks are not available, for example, for mobile development, not Google Play and not App Store uh, allow for rollback. If you want to roll back and put an older version 
on the market in order for people to get the uh, updates, you actually need to declare it as newware and it will get um, it will get into the queue for approval and the approval will happen whenever it will happen. And sometimes it obviously takes uh, more time that is uh, that you want uh, in order to prevent people from suffering. In that case, feature flags might have, you implement two versions of the features in the app itself and trigger them with API calls. So for example, if you introduce a new feature, you can disable it by API call in, in case your progressive delivery goes bad and your observability and notices a problem. This again can be done automatically and um, the, sooner, the sooner the better. And I think the last, the last example that I wanna talk about is MoviePass. Uh, MoviePass, you can see the title, has shut down for several weeks to update their apps. Um, obviously, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, instead of several weeks, we want zero time updates because by the time you will get back from uh, several weeks to perform an update, you won't have any users to wait for you for five weeks. And that's exactly what happened to MoviePass. After this uh, several weeks of updates, they came back to get out of business because no one was there. And instead, you want to strive to get into zero downtime over the air, small and frequent continuous updates. So to summarize, um, continuous updates are frequent, are automatic, are well tested as much as possible, progressively delivered because you cannot test the amount of data we have now. It's state aware. If we reuse the state, we know why and what implications it brings and the observability. Um, we know how to monitor this progressive delivery and we know how to uh, roll back in case uh, something happens. Uh, local rollbacks is kind of an extra credit task, although um, when, when it is required, it's better to be done. So basically what we want to get into is when update available and it's going to be auto updated both for a low risk applications, but also for high risk applications because we actually start to trust the updates. So our goal is to transition from bulk and rare software updates to extremely tiny and extremely frequent software updates, so tiny and so frequent that they provide an illusion of software flowing from development to update target. We call this vision the liquid software because the software is flows and uh, like a liquid and we wrote a book about it. Uh, two co-founders of JFrog, Fred Simon and Joab Lundman and yours truly wrote a book called the liquid software and it has much more details about what um, this uh, session was about. Um, and obviously you are more than welcome to go to the show notes and see how you can get this book. There are some corner cases, obviously, and I want to speak with you a little bit about that. So you might think, well, this is all nice and uh, updating everything whenever update is available, but probably there are some, uh, there are some exceptions, right? Uh, well, the answer is depends. Uh, who thinks that um, up updating a plane mid-flight is a good idea. Uh, probably not a lot of you, but let me try and convince you. Airbus A350 has a memory leak. Uh, it has to be um, rebooted every 149 hours uh, because um, otherwise it will be, uh, you know, it, it crashes. Uh, and um, let's think about the scenario that you are flying. I know it's a completely imaginative scenario now because no one's flying anywhere, but hopefully we will soon enough. And then we fly from uh, Los Angeles to uh, Australia. And uh, somewhere in the middle of Pacific, when we try to be closer to coast, but it's not always possible, the coast is like three uh, hours away. And the co-pilot asked the pilot, did you reset our plane today? Because I think that 149 hours is almost out. And the co-pilot goes like, oops, I think I forgot. So think about now, if we could issue a software update that patches this memory link, would it be nice? And you know what? Patching aircraft's mid-flight is not unheard of uh, during the development. During the development of Boeing 777, um, that was kind of the first plane that has everything done by software. And this is like the Tesla for cars, the 777 was for planes. Everything is electronic, everything is done by software. And there was a problem with uh, turbulence that they couldn't fix. So uh, on, the, on the ground, because it was very hard to simulate. It's exactly like you remember, we cannot uh, check everything pre-production, so we need to check some stuff in production. Same here. 
So they took all the software engineers, boarded the plane, took off, went to the air with turbulence, debug, mid-flight, patched, mid-flight, verified that the, the patch hap, uh, helped, and this is how they solved the problem. So yeah, now you already know that updating uh, planes mid-flight can be done, and sometimes it's a good idea, so you can think how the real exceptions for liquid software are, uh, are limited in scope and applicability. Even an uh, uh, airplane mid-flight might be a good idea. So with that, thank you very much. As I mentioned, at Baruch on Twitter, uh, the hashtag of Liquid Software is Liquid Software. The uh, website for Liquid Software is liquidsoftware.com. And you go to jeffrock.com slash show notes for um, the, the slides, the video that you are looking at now, um, all the links. And again, a small raffle for thanking you for watching this video is also there. So go ahead and fill it. With that, um, I hope we have a time for questions. Um, thank you very much.